Hello, I'm Julian from Worldwide Christian Travel and welcome to When Christians Were Jews with Joel Weinberg. A synopsis along with more information about Joel, Worldwide Christian Travel and GGC can be found in the description. Please give a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you enjoy the lecture. Joel, over to you. Okay, hello everybody. Um, we have to start by saying that the title is wrong on purpose because at the beginning, most people today will agree that the definition of Christian is the wrong definition. That's a later definition, even though it does appear towards the end of the book of Acts. But what we're going to deal with today is an interesting topic which is not dealt with enough. And that's the evolution of the Jewish followers of Jesus. Originally part of the Jesus movement, but most people thought that it died away very early. And in reality, it didn't. So we're going to follow the historical, archaeological, and theological evolution of people that believed in Jesus who were Jewish. They stayed Jewish. In many cases, they stayed observant Jews, but believed in the, in some cases, the deity of Jesus, in some cases, of him being the Messiah. So let's get started. Now, in Matthew 19, we read, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? What did Jesus tell them? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. In other words, you have to keep what later on in Christianity is called the law. He saith unto him, which Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. In other words, quoting from the Ten Commandments. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus replied to him, Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Now, so it's not just following Jesus that, according to what Matthew tells us, that gives you that eternal heaven. It's the keeping of the commandments of what is known as the law. The interesting question that Bart Earhart, the brilliant New Testament scholar, asks his students is, let's say this young person, 20 years later, bumps into Paul and asks him the same question. Stop for a minute and think, would he be giving the same answer? And of course the answer is no. One, this young person who asked Jesus was a Jew. Most of the people who followed Paul were Gentiles. Jesus puts two when they would ask Paul, Jesus was already dead. And as Paul believed, he had already resurrected. But he would have given a very, very different answer. So, so when the, the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He was not willing to do what Jesus told him because he was a wealthy man. What would Paul's answer have been? Let's see. So here we have that question, that 20 years. Now, Paul does not tell the person to follow the law of God. He tells him, believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus and be baptized. Now, also keep in mind, we do not know what Paul knew of Jesus' teachings. The Gospels did not exist in those days, of course. 
but the answer is very, very different. So let's start dealing with Jesus and Judaism. Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So the Jewish followers of Jesus, this is what they are told. For verily, and as I told you in a previous lecture, the word that was most likely used there is amen. Amen, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jolt or one tittle, one kutzoshal yud, little line, is shall in no way pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, so here we have Jesus talking to his earliest followers, all of them Jewish, and he's telling them, you have to keep the law, you have to keep the commandments. And for I say unto you, that ex except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. You have to be more devout than the Pharisees. Now, Jesus, of course, relates to the Pharisees as a large element of cynicism, of hypocrisy, but they were very devout in the keeping of the commandments. You have to be more devout than even them. Now, what we see here in Jesus' teaching is in many ways, if you compare, you see a new Moses. Moses led the children out of Egypt and into the Promised Land. Jesus leads them out of the, as it's as perceived as leading them out of the desert of, of lacking the knowledge of God, but not into the promised land, but into the afterlife. The use of 40 times, many times. So if we're 40 days with Moses on Mount Sinai, 40 days, Jesus on the Mount of Temptation, we can go on for forever and ever, but the whole idea Moses giving the law, Jesus not taking away the law, but fulfilling it in many ways. Now, Jesus' congregation, in Matthew 10 we read, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, or into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. In other words, the message I am giving you is for the Jews. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, because this is the big interesting change with Matthew towards the end, and there's an argument amongst scholars whether this is a later edition or a last will and testament in a way. Because he, the, the, he tells them, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. In other words, reach those nations, but you bring them the message. I am with you always until, even unto the end of the world. Amen. But what, am, what might Jesus be telling them? What you need to teach them is everything I've taught you, including the commandments. Because keep in mind, and we'll talk about this many, many times, Matthew was seen by many as the quote-unquote Jewish gospel. And the audience and the early and even later followers of Jesus amongst the Jews, Matthew was seen as the most important book. So at the very end, even though at the beginning of Matthew, the audience the followers of Jesus, the pre-Christian Christians, of course, were all Jew. Now, what does that mean to bring the commandments to them? We'll see the whole discussion later. But for sure, in the early stages, those who wanted to join this movement, to join this group, had to convert to Judaism. In the early stages, beyond doubt. Because the only way you could really fulfill what was seen as Jesus' message in those days was to accept, 
the law, accept the Torah, accept the commandments, and then become Jewish. Just one interesting thing. The picture we saw here, because I'm going to try to put a little bit of tourism into here, was, of course, the church in Jaffa or Jope. The reason I put that there is because Peter later on had that message of reaching out to the whole world. So here we can see the beautiful church of Peter, one of the three churches in Israel facing the wrong direction. As you know, traditionally, Christian churches face the east. This one faced the West because Peter is to look out into the world in which he was plan is supposed to bring the message. So you see the beautiful, here's the interior of the church of Peter, which is a beautiful, beautiful Gothic oriented church. Matthew, the Jew Jewish gospel and the link to the Hebrew Bible. Because Matthew, because he's reaching out to the Jews in many ways, Everything is based on the Hebrew scriptures, what Christians tend to call the Old Testament. But that uh, Jesus is building on that, but you need the base to understand the fulfillment. In Matthew 5, once again, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, in other words, you're, bringing, you're going up to the temple, one of the commandments, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift, which is very interesting because that's almost identical to the Jewish tradition of the Day of Atonement. You need to first request forgiveness from the, your fellow human being and only then the ritual element has some value. In Matthew 8, we read that it might be fulfilled what is spoken by, it's interesting spelling, of Isaiah, the prophet saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sickness. In other words, Matthew was saying Jesus is fulfilling the prophecies of the Hebrew scriptures. Chapter 13, very similar that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the earth. And last but not least, once again, Matthew, all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying. So what we, what we learn here is that Matthew, and then the Jewish community needed to use the Hebrew scriptures as the basis for the building and the understanding and the believing in Jesus. <coughs> now, the New Testament goes out of its way to emphasize Jesus living a very Jewish life, from circumcision to the presentation, his being what is called the pidyon haben, his is being purchased back in a way in the temple, keeping of the Sabbath, even though, again, arguing within the Jewish law what is permissible but what is not permissible, visiting the synagogue, reading from the Torah from the five books of Moses, reading from the prophets, of course, going to the temple, pilgrimage to the temple, and then even at his death, his death has to fulfill the elements of the Jewish law is being purified, is being buried the same day, and the mourning traditions. Here we can see a beautiful picture of the, the room that is traditionally the room of the Last Supper on Mount Zion. As you can see, the building is classical crusader, so it's over a thousand years after Jesus, but this is a traditional location. And this is where many things within the community, from the Last Supper to Pentecost and other important things, Happened. So the believer community after Jesus' crucifixion. So you have a group of people who continue to believe in Jesus. They are not disillusioned or they were partially disillusioned, but they continue as a community. In Acts 2, we're told, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayer. So here we have the traditions that they have. They're a community that works together. They're a fellowship. 
And then we have, and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together. In other words, here we have one group of Jews who believe in Jesus and had all things common. And they did exactly as Jesus told them. You follow the commandments and you and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple. In other words, they're going to the temple because that's the Jewish commandment. Then they live in Jerusalem. They can partake in the, in, in, in the ceremonies in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Did eat their meat with gladness. Interesting, a very interesting term because in the Bible, there's actually a commandment that when you eat meat, you should rejoice. In singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, interesting enough, very important to read the line and having favor with all people. In other words, they were not excommunicated. They were not even seen as an outside force. They were another one of the movements within Judaism before the temple was destroyed. They did not have issues with their neighbors. Their neighbors did not see them as anything out of the regular. They were another one of the many communities. Interesting enough, it was in the location where many of the Essians in Jerusalem happened to live. Here we can just see, just to get a nice view, here we have a beautiful window from the Mamluk period, just after the Crusaders, in the room. And in it is an inscription, this, you have the Arabic writing that says, judge righteously between people and do not be led astray by your inclination. Now, why do the Muslims feel an important element, an important connection to this room? Because they believe that, and as if anybody goes there underneath there, is a tomb which is accredited to being the tomb of King David. It categorically is not, but it's a holy site for Jews, Christians, and Muslims. In the room, we see a very interesting crusader pillar. And in it, you can see a decoration of flamencos. See the head? Two more over here. Why, interesting enough, it was left by the Muslims, even though in Islam, a graven image is forbidden. You can see an identical pillar on the Temple Mount. But why would the Crusaders have a picture of an element of flamenco? So if we're already in the room of the Last Supper, in the room where the community came together, we can see an interesting thing that in early Christian tradition, we can see leading all the way into the 11th, 12th century, the flamenco still played a part. And here is an interesting little film that might explain why. So here you can see two flamencos. Here you can see a baby flamenco over here. And if you look closely, you can see the father is injuring the mother and its blood is dripping down into the, into the mouth of the baby flamingo. So there's just an interesting little anecdote that you can see that the flamingo literally feeds its youngster its own blood. And that's why that's seen as a symbol that represents Jesus, who the, according to the Christian tradition gave his blood, gave his life, so here, the flamenco is the same, and thus the flamenco has an element of symbolizing, an ele uh, symbolizing Jesus, and that's why that appeared there. Now, here we have, let's look at Luke, and how, what does Luke talk about? How do you reach the Jews? Acts 11, verse 9. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution, now we're talking again, Paul talks about, that arose about Stephen, or s traveled as far as Phoenix and, S and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. So the early followers of Jesus would travel the world over, but their only audience they thought that they needed to reach in the early stages were the Jews. Luke continues. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, 
except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. In other words, the belief was still that the Jesus' message was solely to the Jews. And ye be circumcised means one of two things. Either you're born Jewish and thus you're circumcised on the eighth day, or as part of your conversion process, you are circumcised, and that way you can receive, you can be saved through Jesus. In other words, we're still talking about, as a whole, the followers of Jesus, the followers of the way, are all Jewish and observant Jews. The concept of a non-observant Jew in those days almost did not exist. Now, in Acts 24, we read, For we have found this man, a pestilent fellow, and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of a sect of the Nazarenes. Now it's interesting, the term Nazarene appears already. We'll talk about them very soon. But the Nazarenes were Jews who followed Jesus, but were still totally committed Jews to the commandments and the Jewish way of life, except that they believed in Jesus and in his, and in his deity in this case. Now, with all that said, everything wasn't perfect. We have the koinonia, the group, the community, and in Acts 2, everything seems okay. And they continuously daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread, from house to house did eat the meat with gladness and single, the, and the singleness of heart, as we said. But, Acts 5, but a certain man named Ananias. Now, the name appears, comes many times. It's, the, it's a distortion of the Hebrew name of Hanania. Hanania means God gave him grace. And Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. In other words, they did what Jesus taught but, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. In other words, they found it difficult to full-heartedly do everything Jesus commanded, but they wanted to be part of the group. But Peter said, and again, Peter, one of the leaders, we'll talk about who the leaders of the community were, but Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the price of the land? In other words, you are committed, and if you don't full-heartedly fulfill, you can't be part of the group. In Acts 6, and in those days when the number of disciples was multiplied, multiplied, there arose a murmuring among the Grecians against the Hebrews. Now, the Grecians are not Greeks, are not pagans. They are Hebrew-speaking Greeks, or Greek-speaking Hebrews is a better, better term, Greek-speaking Jews, but that their mother tongue, that they're basic, they could be from Greece, they could be from Rome, they could be from Egypt, but they weren't part of the immediate, uh, original immediate group because the immediate followers were all local from Palestine of those days. Why would they, why'd they have an issue? Because their widows were neglected in the, day, in the daily ministration. In other words, they felt that they were getting a raw deal. It's not clear exactly what it means that the widows were maybe with the distribution of the food, they felt that those who were the Greek speakers were not getting their fair deal. Then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Well, we've got an issue here. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Now, interesting enough, they're going back to the biblical commandment that Jethro had talked about, and you choose 70 smart people. You choose and here it's seven, so it's only 10%, but the group that will then be the leaders. We understand your message. We need you to help us within your own community. But we will give ourselves 
continually to prayer and to minister and the ministry of the word. Now look at the names of the people who were chosen. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, who of course was the proto-martyr, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, another somebody who actually converted. So here we have a group. So one, we have the dealing with people who actually converted, but all the rest are Jews who are Greek-speaking Jews, and so much that they're into the that they have been influenced or their families have been influenced from the Greek-speaking community. They all have Greek names. They don't have Jewish names, but they are part of the group. But there was tension between the original element and the followers. But again, even Nicholas who converted to Judaism, even he was part of the group because he, he, was, he became part of the Jewish people and then part of the followers of Jesus. And that's why, interesting enough, the term that's used in Greek is Hellenistai, which are the Grecians, versus the Hellenists, which is used later on when we talk about the pagans, the, 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 the Gentiles, who are, were the Greeks. So there's a, they, they make a very clear difference in the Greek between the Greek-speaking Jews and the actual Greeks. Acts 21, call out men of Israel help. This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place and further brought Greeks also into the temple. So here we have the example. Is, we'll, we'll deal with this issue a little bit later, but they, you, to bring Greeks into the temple, that's unacceptable because the Greeks are the pagans. If they would have bring Greek-speaking people into the temple, that would have been okay. And of course, dealing with Paul's mission. Now, communal activities. Here you can see only once a year, really twice a year, our service is allowed to be held here, tradition dating back over a thousand years, except during the periods when the Christians controlled the area, and again, once in the room of the Last Supper. Acts 2, as we talked about before, they continued steadfastly with the breaking bread and prayers. In Acts 1, we read about what this group of Jews did. What did they do? And when they were come in, they went up to the upper room. This is the room we're talking about where abode both Peter and James and John. Those were the three leaders of the community, the Jewish community, with James the brother, James the just, James the brother of Jesus. We're not going to get into the issue how Jesus had a brother. And Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew. Again, doesn't sound like a Jewish name, but Bartholomew is really bar Talmai, the son of Talmai. Or, and Matthew, James, and the son of Elpheus, and Simon Zealots, and Judas, the brother of James. So here we have another brother. So, of course, both of them later have books in the New Testament. But, so they all came together, the followers of Jesus together with some additional people. In Acts 12, and when he considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Now, this is very important. Because we learn from here and from other sources that in addition to other things, they would come together, even though they would go to the temple, they'd be Jewish in every way. They did, they, I wouldn't say they separated themselves, but one of the things that made them unique was this breaking bread and praying together in addition to other elements of their Jewish behaviors. This was separating themselves and this was unique to the community. Now, in, I'm sorry, but it is, in 1 Corinthians, I'm not going to be the president of the United States, talks about two Corinthians who walk into a bar, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Their prayers will take place in houses, and that's why 
the early pre-Constantine buildings where they would have the services were called Domus Ecclesia, in other words, a house church. Once again, another source where we talk about church in his house. This is in Dora Europa, which is near the border between Turkey and Syria, the earliest church, or really house that was turned into a church, was found. How do we know that? Because some of the fantastic paintings on the walls. Here we see Jesus walking on water. So this is the earliest place of prayer for, not clear if it was for early Christians or for Jewish Christians where they would come and pray. Here we have the house of Peter. This part was the Domus Ecclesia. This other elements were expanded later, really not the house. It's called the house of Peter. It's probably the house of Peter's mother-in-law because he did not come from Capernaum. But here you see the early element and you can see on the side of the walls, it was the only house there that they actually found plaster on. And also the amazing find is the fishing hooks that were found underneath the, underneath the floor, the only place in Capernaum where fishing hooks were found. Only person to catch a fish with a hook in the New Testament was, of course, Peter. Here we can see part of Capernaum. We'll be talking, we're coming back to Capernaum soon. We can see what the building looked like as it was expanded in third, fourth, fifth century later on. Unfortunately, this is what it looks like today invaded by aliens, and then this spaceship landed on top of it, which is beautiful from the inside, but I think it's an eyesore from the outside built on top of where Peter's house was. Though, the most spectacular pre-Constantine church was found in Megiddo, also known as Armageddon. Now, here you can see one of the four, you can see really two, of the inscriptions on the floor that were found, and it was found in a very problematic place. <laughs> it was found in a, a, underneath a high security prison in that area. As they were doing some fixing and a pipe burst and they had to dig it up, and lo and behind they find what is clearly the earliest church found anywhere. You can see part of the design, the wonderful floor, and in the middle of the floor, this is what you see the two fish. Because keep in mind, the early sign of Christianity was not the cross. The earliest sign was the fish. Now the fish was the earliest sign for multiple reasons. One cross only came into really importance much later. Two, of course, the fishermen, but there was an additional reason. Here you can see an amazing inscription that says, Ichtus, with a type of a cross over here. Now, what does ichtus mean? Why was the fish so important? Because it was seen as an acronym, which stood for Jesus Christus Theo Ios Soter. In other words, Jesus Christ, God's son, is the savior. So it was an acronym that each one of the letters, so it was a secret code. Now, when early Christians would meet, and of course, in times of persecution, you wouldn't ask another Christian, are you Christian? Because if the answer was no, the answer would be no, be your lion's feet. So for that reason, they would have a, a way they would identify each other. One would come along and draw a half a circle. If the other one would complete that into a complete circle, that's how they would tell each other that they were the followers of Jesus. Now, the early Jewish believing community was also known as the Matthian community because, as we talked before, the book that was important to them, the most important of the Gospels, and the way that they followed was defined very much by Matthew. Who were they made up? It was composed of Jesus-believing Jews. They remained within the bounds of Second Temple Judaism. In other words, of course, we're talking up to the destruction of the Temple, so they were still part full-fledged members of the Jewish community. They lived strictly according to the laws of the Torah. In other words, they did not break away. They were not part of a new religion. They were Jews who believed in Jesus. 
and they saw no reason to break away from the mother religion just because they believed in Jesus as the Messiah. Although there were certain elements, of course, in mainstream Judaism, which existed also in Jesus' day, who challenged them, who weren't happy about the message because they theologically disagreed with it. They lived according to the law of Moses and the valid halachic, the Jewish law interpretations of their time. And for that reason, it's very important for them that Jesus was like them. He was a law-abiding Jew. He was observant, as were they. So they were following in his footsteps, both in his teachings and in his actual behaviors. Now, but the tension started with, between Jerusalem and the rest of the world. And here we, are, uh, we see a beautiful icon of the Jerusalem Council, usually dated around the year 49, the leader of the Jewish community of Jerusalem in the middle, of course, James. To his right, you usually when you see a very balding man, that will usually be Paul. And of course, Peter and John and everybody else is here. And even in this, the emphasis on the Jewishness, which is according to the text, but even an Orthodox icon, the importance of understanding we're dealing within a Jewish community. Now, Acts 15 tells us the story of what happened here. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. And that's challenging what Paul is teaching. When therefore Paul and Barnabas, now again, Barnabas, Bar in, Hebrew, in Aramaic is the son of Barnabi, so that would be, that would have been his name, had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Because keep in mind, we're talking 15, less than 20 years after the crucifixion. So the followers of Jesus, those who actually heard from his mouth were still alive. And of course, first source has priority. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phenis and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. In other words, they believe the Gentiles should be converted. So they, as they approached, they continued to proselytize, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church. Again, I always have an issue with the church, with more of a community and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. In other words, so they share what is happening. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believe, in other words, Pharisees, which believed. In other words, you have Jews, Pharisees, who believe in Jesus, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the laws of Moses. In other words, elements within the church or within the movement. And here they say Pharisees, even though most likely the majority at the beginning of the people there, because again, almost everybody who joined the Jesus movement were originally Pharisees, said the only way that these people can become part of the community is they need to be circumcised, they need to convert. And the apostles and the elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up, again, Peter, uh, appointed by Jesus to be the leader, and said unto them, men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought amongst the Gentiles by them. So suddenly they're exposed to a whole new phenomenon that was taking place. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but 
that we write unto them that they abstain from the pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. In other words, these things you must abstain for are following Moses' law. We'll talk about this in a minute. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. So here we have in the Council of Jerusalem, two elements of Jesus' followers now exist. The circumcised, the Jews, and the Gentiles. And Galatians, of course, is the source where that later on is explained and implemented. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, again, Greek, non-Jew, was compelled to be circumcised. But counterwise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter. So here are the two groups, Peter to the circumcised, and of course, Paul to the non-circumcised. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. And when James, Caiaphas, interesting enough, using the Aramaic name of Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So two groups have been founded. And it, it ends with, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of Gentiles. In other words, the clear element, but Peter, the Paul, still considers himself part of the chosen community. Now, the Noahide laws to the Gentiles or to the pagans, but the Bible speaks to them. So what are they commanded to do? In Acts 15, we just read, Where's for my sentence is that we trouble them not, but what are they to do? They have to abstain from idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. These are known as the Noahide laws. Acts 25, it continues, and there are seven laws which are said to have been obligatory to Noah, and every person in the world is obliged to keep them. So, in order to be a follower of Jesus, in order to have the chance of going to heaven, you have to keep these basic rules. Dinim, in other words, you have to have an element of law, of courts. You're forbidden from idolatry, blasphemy, sexual immorality, bloodshed, in other words, killing, robbery, and an element of hum of, of of morality and treating of other gods, others, other creations, the animals. Because there was a tradition in those days that a limb was torn from a living animal. But in other words, the whole element of forbidding mistreatment of God's creations. Those are the seven things which are more or less repeated here. So here we have the tradition of the Noahide laws, which existed already in the time of Jesus, or a short time after his life, that was the basic element. So these traditions which exist already then had to be kept. Now, where does this come from? In Leviticus 17, we read, And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn amongst you, in other words, non-Jews, that eateth any matter of blood, blood is forgiven, just as we read here, which is connected to the ever minachai, the animal or the humane element, and you're not allowed, I will 
even set my face against that Saul. In other words, they're basing what they're not allowed to do on the biblical commandments. Ye shall therefore keep my status and my judgments. Thou shall not commit any of these abominations. These were mainly sexual abominations that were mentioned before in Leviticus 18. Neither any of your nation nor a stranger who sojourneth amongst you. For all these abominations have the men of the land done which were before you and the land is defiled. In other words, you need to preserve these elements because it's a biblical commandment. In other words, they're basing what a Gentile needs to do on the commandments in the Torah. So here, you know, there's an interesting thing that there is actually a movement today to encourage people, which is a movement from Judaism, which is quite strange and rare, but to have everybody in the world abide by the seven Noahide laws. So you see a more comical element. Here you can see an ad in Japanese. Now, interesting enough, here you can see the bottom says, long live our master, our teacher, our rabbi, our rabbi, King Mashiach. In other words, he is the Messiah. This Acts group, which is a interesting sect within Judaism today, some people say they've removed themselves from Judaism, who actually believe that the rabbi who was dead for many years is actually the Messiah. So if you have the Jewish movement to abide by the Noahide laws, you actually have a movement against the Noahide laws. Now, it's a funny thing. It says, stop Noahide law, equal rights for non-Jews. The funny thing is Noahide laws is only for non-Jews. Jews have to keep them, but many other things. This is mainly led by groups that have, well, as an example, the, the element of, of the one God, which you're, so pagan groups will not be able to abide by them. And then there's an issue with that. Now, suddenly, in the year 66, we have a revolt against the Romans. And the Jesus movement does not want to be involved in it. Many Jews do not want to be involved either. But they want to preserve their community. So we are told by Eusebius, fourth century bishop of Caesarea, and he says this, just before the beginning of the Jewish revolt against Rome in 66, Christians in Jerusalem, interesting, he used the term Christians, even though we're talking about the Jewish Christians, the Jewish followers of Jesus, were warned in an oracle to leave Jerusalem and go to Pella, which is in Transjordan, we'll see exactly where it is, and the Decapolis, one of the 10 cities. So the Jewish community of Jerusalem, which was the center, that's not the only place, of course, where there were Jewish followers of Jesus, they were all over the Galilee. But they uprooted and the leadership moved over to Transjordan. Epiphanius, end of fourth century says, all those who believed in Christ, in other words, Jewish Christians, had generally come to Pella of the Decapolis. Now, 60 years later, a new thing happened. There was another revolt. In this case, it was known as the Bar Kokhva revolt. And in the Bar Kokhva revolt against Hadrian, Bar Kokhva was seen as the Messiah. And many people, that's why then his name was changed to Bar Kokhva. In other words, the son of the stars. The other name that was given to him by his opposition was Bar Kuziva, which means the son of a lie. But the, the Jewish followers in no way could follow him because by following him, they would say that Jesus was not the Messiah, but Bar Kokhva was. So once again, they were challenged and did not join the two revolts that existed against the Romans in both cases. The first time to save the community, and the second time for theological reasons. This is the ancient city of Pella, the Decapolis, which is located right over here. This is the Dead Sea. Jerusalem is somewhere around here. Here's Mount Nebo, or Mount Nebo, where Moses looked into the land. Just north of the Dead Sea is the baptismal site where the children of Israel crossed over, where Elijah and Elisha changed leadership, and of course, 
where Jesus was baptized. Jarosh, another one of the great cities of Decapolis, and here is Pella, just to the north, let's say three quarters of the way between the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. So the, the Jewish followers of Jesus, and again, keep in mind, in, the, in this part of the world in those days still, where long after Paul, most of the believers in Jesus were still observant Jews. They escape over to Pella, where they feel safe, and most of them stay there for some time. Nepal, who Paul was and what his believings, once again, the bald head, the beard, he described himself as being an unattractive man. What Paul's approach to Judaism, even though it's quite clear to my opinion from the New Testament has changed from Paul who abandoned Judaism because he reached out to the Gentiles to today it's more seen as Paul the Jew. Luther clearly said, Paul places grace above works, in other words, above the Torah. Nowadays, it's changed, to a great extent, based on historical research, but also based on what the New Testament says, it just depends how you read it. Because in 1 Galatians, we're told, for ye have heard of my conversion, no, my, my conversation, in time past in Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Paul's confessing his sins, that he persecuted against the early Jesus movement. But in Romans 11, we're told, and so all Israel, the Jewish people, shall be saved. As it is written, thou shalt come out of Zion, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Jacob Israel is, a, is a, we're exchanging names, for this is my covenant unto them, and when I shall take away their sins. And concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, the chosenness of the Jewish people, they are beloved for their father's sake. In other words, it's not that the church is going to come and replace the Jewish people. You'll have two entities. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Well, God bless the Jewish people, Paul is saying, that stays with them. In Romans 7, he says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I'm still connected. Romans again. What advantage then hath the Jew or what profit is there of circumcision, much every way chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. In other words, the chosenness is there, but you can join the party. In 2 Timothy we read, I am grateful to God, whom I worship with clear conscience, as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day. So he's not breaking off his ties with the Jewish people. And again, talking about himself, circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, I am a Pharisee. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness under the law, I am blameless. I have in no way broken the law. Acts 23, when Paul notices that some of the Sadducees and others were Pharisees, he called out the council, brothers, I am a Pharisee. Not I was a Pharisee. I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisee. I am on trial concerning the hope of the resurrection of the dead. Because the Pharisees believe in the resurrection of the dead, the Sadducees do not. I'm a, Sadduce, I'm a Pharisee. I believe in what the Pharisees believe in. The story with the book of John is very, the gospel of John is very different. One, it's almost all researchers agree it was the last one written. Written beginning of the second century, I'd say most research will say today. And John already feels much more than the other gospels the tension between elements within the Jewish world and the growing Christian movement. And that's why he's, very, he's much more 
aggressive, attacks more because of his theology. And he says, these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Then he also continues, nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. In other words, many of the Jews. But because the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. So once again, but in reality, you can see anywhere Paul went, the synagogue was open. We'll be talking in just a couple of minutes about how the synagogue, the, the believers in Jesus and the non-believer and, and the traditional Jews shared the synagogues together. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. In other words, John's talking about these people, that they will be removed from the community. In reality, that did not happen. Now, one of the interesting things is why did Christianity need to stay Jewish? Which is a strange statement, because Christianity didn't stay Jewish. But in the early stages of Christianity, of the Jesus movement, they could not break away from claiming to be part of Judaism. Dio Cassio says this, they succeeded in winning the right to observe their laws freely. We're talking about the Jews. Because the only group that was allowed to practice a religion freely, that was not dedicated to the beliefs of the Roman Empire were the Jews. They are distinguished from the rest of mankind in practicality, every detail of their way of life, and especially in that they honor none other, none of the other gods, but show extreme reverence for one particular deity. They never had a statue of him, even in Jerusalem itself, but believing him to be unnameable and invisible, they worship him. We're talking about the, the, the Jewish people in the most extravagant way amongst, among humans. They built him a large and splendid temple and dedicated to him the day that they call Saturn, which is interesting. It's Shabbat, but they, it was the day of Saturn, in those days, on which among many others, most peculiar observances, they undertake no serious occupation. In other words, the Jews were the only people who were allowed to practice their religion freely other other groups had to be absorbed into the Roman way of life. So if Christians said, we're a new religion, we're not part of the Jews, they will immediately be persecuted. They have to observe the Roman traditions. So if they say, we are Jews, we are one of the additional movements within the Jewish world, then they can continue. Rome allowed Jews to practice their religion even though many Roman leaders considered Jews barbaric and superstitious. And as long as Christians were considered a group within Judaism, they had the same rights as other Jews. But as Christians separated from Judaism, many Jews began to insist that Christians could no longer claim to be Jews. As a result, the Romans began persecuting Christians as a threat of their empire. So once the two elements, especially with the pagan movement, broke away, so the Romans began to persecute. We come across some interesting mentionings of Jesus and the early Jewish Christians or Jewish followers in Avodah Zarah, which is, the, the, which is a, the tractite in the Talmud, which is dedicated to idolatry or discussions, not solely. And we're told, all propose the, of the above discussion, the Gemara relates the Gemara is the Talmud, relates incidents involving sages who were sentenced by ruling authorities. And here the actual quote. The sages taught when Rabbi Eliezer, second century rabbi, was arrested and charged with heresy by the authorities, they brought him up to a tribunal to be judged. A certain judicial officer said to him, why should an elder like you engage in frivolous matters of heresy? Now, what was the heresy? We're going to skip forward. Again, he was found not guilty, but when he came back, his students challenged him. When Rabbi Lazar came home, his students entered to console him for being accused of heresy, which he took as a sign of sin, and he did not accept their words of consolation. 
Rabbi Akiva, who was one of the great leaders, again, second century, and one of the big supporters of Bar Kokhba and the revolt, said, my teacher, allow me to say one matter for all of the, what you taught me. Rabbi Eliezer said to him, speak. Rabbi Akiva said to him, my teacher, perhaps some statement of heresy came before you. So why were you accused of heresy? What could you have said? And then he, there's a whole discussion. And then Rabbi Lazar said to him, Akiva, you are right. As you have reminded me that once I was walking in the upper marketplace of Tsipori, Sephrius, right near Nazareth, and I found a man who was one of the students of Jesus of Nazarene. And his name was Yaakov of Kfar Shekhania. So in other words, he came in contact with a Jew following Jesus, second century, still prevalent, still around there. And then the discussion, we're not going to get into what the discussion was, but the presence and the rabbis in those days saw that as a sign of heresy. So they were there, though in other places we will see very soon. In the, ever, the Jews will recite a prayer three times a day, which is known as Shimon Esra, because it had 18 prayers in it. A 19th prayer, which was the 12th prayer, was called Birkat HaMinim. Minim is somebody who's a heretic, who's a non-believer. The, the prayer goes like this. For the apostates, let there be no hope. And let the arrogant government be speedily uprooted in our days. Let the Minim be destroyed in a moment and let them be blotted out of the book of life and not inscribed together with the righteous. Blessed are thou, our Lord, who humblest the arrogant. Now, the question was, was this directed towards Jews who believed in Jesus or was it directed towards Jews who believed in heresy, which was considered hardcore heresy in those days? Later on, six, seven, eight, generations later, Jews who converted to what in those days was Christianity, they were for sure included in this. And actually the term Nutsri, which is a term used for Christians in Hebrew, was added to it. There's an argument, is this directed towards Jewish believers in Jesus or not? The person who was considered the greatest scholar of Jesus 20 some odd years ago, interestingly enough said this was directed toward the Sadducees who continued to not believe in heaven, and we're talking late first, early second century. We're gonna quickly talk about five groups of Jews who believed in Jesus. Four of them were considered heretics by the church leaders. The fifth group, there was an argument about. Serithians, again, each one of the groups is named after somebody who founded the movement. There's a great picture, which are by an artist called Gottlieb. All the pictures of this man is the actual artist in various stages of his life. What did the Serithians believe in? They recognized Jewish scripture and professed to follow the God of the Hebrews. They followed the Jewish law. But they used Matthew, but of course, only from chapter, not of course, but from chapter three genealogy is taken out, denied, denied God's creation of the world, and rather believed that it was created by a demurrage, by, by, a, by almost like a devilish element, which again, these could be considered minim, because that's a total break from the traditional Jewish movement. But keep in mind that in Christianity in those days, there were hundreds of groups that each believed in different things. They denied the supernatural virgin birth of Jesus, and they believed it, he was the biological son of Joseph and Mary. Christ descended onto him in the form of a dove from the supreme ruler at baptism. And Jesus died, did not resurrect, but one day he will rise with all men. So here's one group, which we can understand why mainstream church would define them as heretics. But once again, it's a group of Jews who believe in Jesus actually follow Matthew to an extent, but of course are far from what then became mainstream Judaism. The Samashians, 
They were descendant of Pharisees. They fully abided by Jewish law. They called themselves Jesus followers or Christians. They believed that Jesus was merely a man. So the, the, like the early Arians also very similar who were then of course removed from the church in the fourth century. They, they on one hand became part of the Jewish people through circumcision, but they baptized themselves to be Christians. They believed that the human body was not created by God, but by the devil, and that it should be abused in every way possible. Once again, not mainstream Judaism, but of course not mainstream Christianity either. The Elkesites, led by a guy called Elkes, all believers had to be circumcised. You have to live according to the law. There's special obligations of baptism for those who have misbehaved sexually. So there's a special type of purifying yourself closer to the Jewish purification than the Christian baptism. Christ was born and reborn many times in a normal manner before being born of a virgin, which is an interesting evolution from a tradition that existed in those days that God had created and destroyed the world. So Jesus was born many times until he was born in a perfect shape from their times. The book of Elksai was said to be inspired by an angel of enormous size who was the son of God and the second female angel who was the Holy Spirit. So here we already have Greek elements coming to play, which again, these people, <laughs> the Jews would say, whoa, nothing to do with Judaism. We're far from Judaism. The Christians would say far from what we're talking about. The Ebonites was a much more serious, large group. Most people will say that the term Ebonite comes from the Hebrew word Evion. Deuteronomy 15, we read, the poor, the Evion shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother. In other words, the poor people. First Samuel, chapter two, he raiseth up the poor, the Evion, out of the dust and lifted up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes. So they literally saw themselves fulfilling Samuel. They are the poor, they will riseth up. Here's what Arrhenius said in almost the year 200. In other words, these people were still very prominent in those days. They had a different gospel written in Greek, which was related to Matthew. In other words, a similar book based on Matthew, that was the base. The world was created by God, so they're mainstream Jews. Jesus was merely a, was a son of Joseph and Mary. Holy Spirit entered him in baptism. So here, once again, you can see the linking between the different elements. Paul was bad. Almost all the Jews agreed with that in those days because they felt that, Jew, that, that the belief in Jesus should stay within the Jewish people. The Ebonites celebrate Eucharist, but with water. They practiced circumcision. They went to the temple. They lived in a village called Kochva, interesting enough, named after Bar Kochva, the false Messiah. They left Pella and moved to Kochva, and they rejected eating meat. Interesting element, the rejection of eating meat has two things, has two, has the basic element is with Jesus not eating meat at the Last Supper, but then, but John the Baptist did eat meat. We're told, well, at least he ate, he, he ate locusts. That's why they reinterpreted his, they said he didn't eat locusts, that he ate patties. <laughs> Where did they get that from? I learned this from my mother-in-law who originally comes from Algeria because locusts are kosher, and the Jews in Algeria would eat locusts, but they would make patties out of them. So maybe that's the actual origin. So here you have the Ebonites who, not mainstream Christianity, that's why there was no argument that they were considered heretics from the Christian perspective, but they were, again, very similar to the first groups who had been removed from Christianity. And last but not least, the Nazarenes, because they were the main element of Jews who believed in Jesus. And Epiphanius, so we're talking fourth century, late fourth century, 
describe the community as this. They do not call themselves Christians, which was the term in those days, but Nazarenes, which we'll understand in one minute where that comes from. They remained wholly Jewish and nothing else, for they used not only the New Testament, but the old like the Jews. Here we're having their elements within Christianity who are distancing themselves in those days from the Hebrew scriptures. They live according to the preaching of the law as among the Jews. They have a good mastery of Hebrew language. And interesting enough, there's Eusebius testifies that they used the book of Matthew in Hebrew. For the entire law and the prophets and what is called the scriptures, I mentioned the poetical books, Kings, Chronicles, and Esther, and all the others are read in Hebrew by them, as that is the case with Jews, of course. Only in, res only in this respect, they differ from the Jews and Christians. With the Jews, they do not agree because of their belief in Christ. With the Christians, because they are trained in the law, in circumcision, the Sabbath, and other things. In other words, they are devout Christians, as were the Christians of those days, but they still stuck to the Jewish world. And just a quick comment on Jesus of Nazareth. They were called Nazarenes. In 1 John, we're told, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law, in other words, as we talked before, Jesus being the personification of, of Moses and the prophets, did write Jesus of Nazareth. Now, we're not going to get into the very problematic element because he shouldn't be called Jesus of Nazareth. He should be called Jesus of Bethlehem. But that's a different story for a different discussion. And Nathaniel made the famous statement. Nathaniel's traditionally said to be the same person as Bartholomew. Nathaniel might have been his name, Nathan El, God gave him. And he said, can there be any good thing coming out of Nazareth? Now, so he was in the Hebrew, Yeshua, Ben Yosef Minatrat, Joshua, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Now, the root of Natrat is Nzr, Netzer. Now, in St. Geronimus, St. Jerome, Geronimus, says that the term Netzer comes from Isaiah chapter 11. In Hebrew, it says, Vayetze choter mi geza yishai, v'netzer mi shorashav yifre. And there come a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch. The branch is really an offspring. So it's something that grows a life that comes out of it. He's an offspring of King David. And that's where Jesus, the, he says the term, the, he's Nutsri, which is the Hebrew word till today for somebody who is Christian. It's an offspring. Another interpretation can be from Psalms. And we read in Psalms, Kol orchot Adonai chesed v'emet l'notzrei brito v'edotav. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful to those who keep his commandments. Netzer, it means you keep it close to your heart. You preserve them. So that can be another source of the term Nazarene or somebody and Jesus of Nazareth. Now, interestingly enough, we read in John 19, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and writing Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. In Hebrew, Yeshua Notsri Melech Yehudi. Inri is of course the Greek term that's used for it. So there you have the elements where the term in Hebrew, Notsri for Hebrew can really come from three different words. The first big, the major end of this <laughs> semi-loving relationship between the Jewish Christians and the Christians in the Council of Nicaea. Now, one of the reasons is we have to keep in mind there were over, I think there were 310 bishops who participated, only 18 really had contact with Jewish Christians because they came from the land. All the brethren who are in the East who formerly celebrated Easter with the Jews, whom from ancient time had celebrated the feast at the same time as the Romans, with us and with all those who from ancient times have celebrated the feast at the same time. Because till Nicaea, 325, 
the day of Easter was calculated to be on the same day as the first day of Passover. So the Jews and the Christians celebrated, the Jewish who were not believers in Jesus celebrate Passover, and the Jewish Christians or the Jewish believers in Jesus celebrated it at the same time. And from Nicaea, Passover and Easter can never fall on the same day. You change the calculations, and with that, you lead to a split. Because the Jewish followers of Jesus would want to continue celebrating it according to the Jewish tradition. And here you have a huge split, and that's the beginning of the end. We'll skip this, and, we'll, and those who do not observe the decision respecting the Holy Festival of Easter made by the Holy Great Synod of Nicaea, assembled in the presence of the most pious emperor, Constantine, are to be excommunicated and cut off from the church. So the Jewish followers of Jesus are now removed because they can't, they have to choose. Do you go with the vast majority in those days who were Gentiles who converted to Christianity or do you continue to keep your tradition? And that in a way began to bring an end to the Jewish Christian, Judeo Christian community. A quick run through of what we have of finds that are said to be connected to the Jewish Christian community and what we don't have, which is also in some ways not less important, where the church, Dominus Flevites, in other words, our Lord wept on the Mount of Olives, a necropolis was found. On the tomb, it said, Judah, the son of Judah, proselyte. Now, on some of the tombs, you actually have Christian sounding proper names, like Kirikos, you would probably not come across Jews, but it was a Jewish burial tomb for sure. Some of them had X's before the name Jesus. Again, some of the people's names might also have been Jesus. And in one of them, there was a cross chiseled next to the name Jude. So some believe that this was a Jewish, Judo-Christian graveyard, first, second, maybe even third century. In Murhabarat, there was a, in the Judean desert, they found a letter by Simon Bar Kochva, the leader of the revolt that the Jewish followers of Christian would not find, would not follow, and they found a letter to Galilean Jewish Christians that were threatened with imprisonment if they did not aid the rebellion. So now, thanks to this letter that survived 2,000 years, we know that there was a Jewish Christian presence, in other words, Jews who followed Jesus. Interestingly enough, he wasn't excommunicating them. But you're part of the Jewish people. You have to be part of the revolt. So here we can see how the Jews there were part of, and here we see one of the letters that was found there, beautiful Hebrew writing on parchment. In Capernaum, many founts were found there. One of the most amazing ones is Pillar that you can see whenever you go there. And unfortunately, most tour guides pass it by. And here it says, Chalfo, a name, Bar, the son of Zbedia, remember the name? <laughs> Bar Yochanan, John. Eved Hadana Muda, he doted, he dedicated this pillar. Here we see Zabdia and John, two names which appear in the New Testament connected originally to Bethsaida, but then over here. Names continue generation to generation to generation. We see it in uh, Zabdia, which means God gave an offering. So here we have a direct link in names, at least, to some of the names from the New Testament. There's also an amazing synagogue that some people will say that was a synagogue of the Jesus prayed in when he was in Capernaum. The interesting thing is, of course, we find no Christian synagogues in the Galilee, but we know of major Jewish Christian presence. Why is that? Beyond doubt, it is because the Jews and the, the, the rabbinical Jews and the Jewish Christians were still, still considered themselves one faith. They argued on theological elements. Jesus is the Christ, is not. 
but they were still devout Jews. That's why there are no churches, almost in the, in the area of Jesus preaching, churches are not found there until the time of Constantine, and even later, because the Jewish Christian presence was still prominent there. And for that reason, the Jewish Christian movement continued. Jews who believed in Jesus continued much later than we thought. And where do we come across that? In the Second Council of Nicaea in 787, that's when they finally ruled that a Jew cannot be a believer in Jesus. And every Jew who wanted to be part of the church had to, I renounce absolutely everything Jewish, every law, right, and custom. So if such a ruling was made, that means and even in 787, you had Jewish followers of, of Jesus. They preserved their Jewish tradition, and once, if, if the first council in 325 made it extremely difficult, the second one made it impossible. Today, you will come across people who call themselves Messianic Jews, Jews for Jesus, etc. That's a new movement, and they are categorically different than the early Jewish Christians. And the number one reason is the Jewish Christians, the early Jewish followers of Jesus, were totally committed to the laws of the Torah. But they were also totally committed to Jesus. The modern day Messianic Jews are very few of them are committed to the laws of the Torah. They're committed to their those who 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 who, can, who are defined at least for according to the Jewish law as Jews are committed to Jesus in much and to their Jewish background, but not to the Jewish law that the early followers of Jesus were 100% as they saw it, Jewish and 100% Jewish according to the laws, circumcision, etc., and 100% followers of Jesus. So now we have a slightly better understanding of when Christians were Jews, or at least, and of course it's a wrong title as we started by saying, but when many of Jesus' followers were still fully devout Jews. So thank you for your attention, and we will meet again soon. Thanks, Joel. If you enjoyed this lecture and would like to see more, please give a thumbs up and subscribe. Information on our biblical tours can be found on our website, christian-travel.com, and a link is in the description. Thank you.